morning, everyone. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who has left home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me and the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them, persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be lost, and the last first. This is the word of God. Well, good morning everybody. Lovely to see you. Um, yeah, it really is lovely to see you. I would encourage us all to uh, set aside any concerns we might have about the virus, uh, the distractions of wearing masks and sitting miles apart from one another, and uh, bow with me now and ask the Lord to speak to you as we look at this very special passage together. Let's, uh, let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the tremendous privilege of an open Bible. And once again this morning we think of those many brothers and sisters around the world living in countries where this is a sheer impossibility. Help us, Lord, not to take this privilege for granted. What we know not will you teach us, what we have not will you give us, and what we are not will you make us. And we ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, do please uh, keep that passage open in front of you. On the 19th of May, 1845, uh, two ships from the Royal Navy set sail under the command of Sir John Franklin. Their mission was to find uh, a navigation channel through the Canadian Arctic. And uh, as they sailed towards what was then one of the coldest places on earth, uh, their preparations were frankly bizarre. Because instead of taking extra fuel, uh, extra warm clothing and extra blankets, they took a large library, an organ, china place settings, cut glass wine goblets and solid silver cutlery engraved with the officers' initials and their families' crests. Within just a few weeks, both ships were trapped in the ice. Uh, Three years later, a search party was sent out to look for them. Uh, But all they found was clumps of bodies of men who had set off to look for help when the food and supplies ran out. 
Uh, One skeleton was found dressed in his fine blue cloth uniform, edged with silk braid, Uh, hardly really sufficient protection against the bitter Arctic cold. Another officer apparently chose to carry with him his solid silver cutlery. Uh, what What must he have been thinking to take solid silver tableware while he was desperately looking for food and help? And commenting on this disaster, which claimed the lives of 129 men, one writer says this, and I quote, It is inconceivable that any of these men would have said as they neared death on the frozen landscape, I wish I had brought more silver cutlery. And yet, when we hang on to things that are ultimately useless, one day we are going to look equally foolish, end quote. It's so easy to do, isn't it? To cling on to things or priorities or a lifestyle or habits that are ultimately useless and which might actually in the end destroy us. And that's why Mark has included this incident for us in his Gospel. Uh, Here we see Jesus talking to someone that we would consider to be a really impressive young man. The outcome, though, is so unexpected. Now, in our last study in Mark's Gospel, we saw children who would normally not be given very much time and attention in that culture, nevertheless being wonderfully welcomed by Jesus. And here we see someone who would normally be given plenty of time and attention actually walking away from Jesus. Very few people actually walk away from Jesus unhappily in the Gospels, but this man does. And therefore I think the obvious question in the passage is why do we have here someone rejecting Jesus and walking away in sadness? The clue that gets us started is in verse 17, if you'd like to look at it, where we're told that Jesus is on his way. Specifically, he's on his way to Jerusalem and the cross, And there, Jesus is going to be rejected by his friends, by his enemies, and yes, even by God the Father. And as Jesus makes his way to the cross, he's inviting different groups of people to take up the cross of discipleship. I hope you'll remember from a previous study that we discovered that there are actually two crosses, not one, in the Christian life. There's the cross of salvation, which Jesus alone has already carried for us. And then there's the cross of discipleship, which uh, every Christian must take seriously. Uh, When you take up the cross of discipleship, what it means is that you are trusting and obeying Jesus. So even though this rich young man is terribly impressive, And even though we're told that Jesus loves him, he gets no special treatment. And I think that fact alone should cause us to read the passage really carefully. So let's consider it under three headings this morning. First, there is a respectable seeker. Uh, That's verse 17. A respectable seeker. Then in verses 18 to 22... There is a loving confrontation. A loving confrontation. And then thirdly, in verses 23 to 31, there is a powerful Lord. So just those three things. Firstly, a respectable seeker. Let me read verse 17 for us again. As Jesus started on his way, A man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now the key thing here is that although the appearance is encouraging, the reality is not. Uh, This rich young man runs to Jesus, that looks encouraging, Uh, he kneels before him, 
That also looks really encouraging. He asks a terrific question, that's encouraging. But as we go on through the passage, we discover the reality is rather different. This man wants eternal life, yes he really does. But he's not prepared to give up anything in order to enjoy it. So, despite all of the talk about believing in the life to come and wanting to inherit the life to come, his priorities, well, they're very firmly anchored in this world. And yet, Jesus reaches out to this man. And in the process, Jesus gives us a vital lesson in evangelism. What is it? A few years ago, uh, a short paperback was published which shocked the church. Uh, It was called Today's Gospel, Authentic or Synthetic. Uh, The author was a man called Walter Chantry. And in the book he said that Jesus evangelised with great courage and love. But he said people today are giving simplistic, superficial, weak gospel messages. And uh, in the introduction to his book, he addresses the pastors, and he says this, Pastors, have you not wondered about those supposed converts who are as worldly as they were before? Uh, Those who have apparently decided for Christ, but you can't tell what they decided. They're not godly or zealous. They don't study the word. They don't mind if they're absent when it is preached. They give no evidence of true conversion. Pastors, have you considered the possibility they were never evangelised at all? Have your preaching and methods led them to comfort apart from Christ? Well, sobering words. And uh, in the book, Chantry goes on to highlight the love and the courage which Jesus shows right here in Mark chapter 10. And he says to the pastors, you know, you would love to have this rich young ruler run up to you. He'd be a marvellous trophy for you. You would offer him an easy prayer. Then you would report his conversion as widely as possible. But Jesus would not stoop to such tricks. He evangelises with integrity. So when the rich young man asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's asking a brilliant question. And I wonder how you would answer it. Uh, I imagine for a moment that the person sitting next to you or two metres away from you turned to you and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, I wonder what you'd say. Probably the best biblical answer, you can write this down, is God doesn't want you to do anything. He wants you to forget about your abilities and your performance. What he wants you to do is put your confidence and trust in Jesus. That's the answer the Lord Jesus gives in John chapter 6, for example, where the (coughs) the disciples say, what does God want us to do? And Jesus replies, well, just believe. And when the Philippian jailer was scared out of his wits in the book of Acts, and he asked the Apostle Paul, what should I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus. But occasionally, you see, Jesus can see that the person asking the question is just a bit too full of themselves. And they need to be brought to a place where they can see their need. And that's what Jesus is doing in this conversation. And that leads me to our second point this morning, which is a loving confrontation in verses 18 to 23. Now please don't miss the importance of this. Because you see, we're living in ungodly days when people are frankly careless about the things of God. So if somebody came up to you during the week and said, "Um, I hear you go to church, tell me, 
How can I be saved? Well, I think if you're like me, I think you'd be astonished, because it doesn't happen very often. I'm sure you'd be pleased they asked, it'd be a very exciting moment, and it would be very tempting, wouldn't it, to say something that wouldn't annoy them or put them off. But the question is, are we able to speak to such people knowing that God is in charge and that our job is to be faithful rather than popular? Because you see, Jesus here helps the rich young man to see the cost. And I want you to notice how he does it. Have a look at verse 18. First of all, Jesus rattles this man's cage because his thinking is so shallow. Uh, The young man rushes up to Jesus, says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus zooms in on that word, good. Why do you call me good? What do you mean by that? And you need to know that in those days, uh, the Jews didn't throw that word good around in the same kind of carefree way that you and I might do today. Because in those days, the word good only ever applied to God and the things of God. So what Jesus, you see, is saying to this man is, when you called me good, are you saying that I am God? Is that what you mean? Um, Are you putting me on the same level as God, or are you actually only trying to flatter me? So that's the first thing. The second thing Jesus does here is that he exposes the man's shallow living. He quotes uh, six of the Ten Commandments, and you'll notice that the ones that he quotes are concerned with our neighbour. Uh, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't murder, and so on. And Jesus wants to see whether this young man has a conscience at the level of his dealings with other people. But he seems to have no conscience. He says, yeah, I've kept all of them. If we're being really charitable, I suppose he could mean I've kept them outwardly. After all, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3 uh, that he was blameless in regard to the law. And when he said that, what Paul meant was, well, in terms of what people could see with their eyes, I was doing pretty well. And I guess in the same way someone today might say, well, yes, I've kept the Ten Commandments, I I haven't murdered anybody, Uh, I haven't robbed a bank, so I'm okay. But I hope you know that God hasn't given us the Ten Commandments so that we can kind of tick them off like a shopping list and get to the end and say, well, I'm absolutely safe. No, the idea is that as we work our way through the Ten Commandments, we're meant to feel unsettled, even convicted, and say, actually, I need help. Is there a rescuer for someone like me? That's how the Ten Commandments are meant to work when we work our way through them. So Jesus sees right through this young man. He can see that he's shallow in his thinking, that he's shallow in his living. Jesus can always tell the true from the fake, and you and I can't always do that. Uh, On one of the news feeds recently, there was a report of a man in Florida uh, being pulled over in his car by the police. And when they searched the car, uh, they found some crystal meth on the floor. So the man was arrested, his name and contact details were taken. But when they sent the substance off to the lab to be tested, they discovered it wasn't crystal meth at all. It was actually the sugar that had fallen off his Krispy Kreme donut. So now this man is apparently suing the police department because of the way that he was treated. And of course the police had reached the wrong conclusion about him. But Jesus doesn't make those kinds of mistakes. He can see exactly what's fake and exactly what's real. 
And then look at the hammer blow in verse 21. Jesus has seen the shallow thinking. He's seen the shallow living. Verse 21. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. I think it's lovely that we're told in verse 21 that Jesus loved him. You see, the reason that Jesus spoke to the man like this is because he loved him. He wanted this man to know the way of salvation. He wanted him to have eternal life. And so Jesus tells him the truth. Now I need to say that um, what Jesus says to this particular man is not the New New Testament standard for everybody. Um, As the passage was being read, you may have thought perhaps that I might be telling you to give away everything you own. But that isn't the point. Jesus tells this particular young man to sell everything and give it to the poor because, now listen to this, this young man already had a king. And his king was money. And he's not willing to exchange king money for King Jesus. Perhaps the saddest thing of all in the passage is, if you think about it, this man didn't really possess his possessions. They actually possessed him. He was quite literally a possessed young man. Uh, not possessed by evil spirits, but he was possessed by his possessions. I hope you realise that money and possessions, they're not the biggest problem for everybody. And that's why Jesus doesn't tell everybody to give away what they have. And there are some people who are wealthy, they've been blessed with possessions by God, but they don't possess them. God may have given them great wealth, but the money isn't everything to them. So they're happy to share it, to give it to those in need, and even if they lose it, it's not the end of the world. But you see, those people might have a different God in their lives. And the challenge for you and me as we work our way through this passage is to try and work out what is the controlling influence in our own hearts and in our own lives. One of the ways that you can tell what the particular idol might be in a person's life is to watch how they react if you try and take it away. Because if it's exercising a controlling influence over their lives, when you try and take it away, they're likely to become extremely angry. It could be that they've got some kind of secret life going on. Maybe it's a a secret sex life. Or it could be that they expect to be able to control everyone around them, even themselves. And it could be that there's a very deep-rooted pride which says, I'm not turning to Jesus. I'm not confessing my sin. So, my friend, if Jesus was speaking lovingly to you this morning, one-on-one, and if he could see something in your life that comes first, that has a higher priority than Christ himself, I wonder what it would be. Because, you see, if there's anything at all that comes before Jesus Christ in your life, that is your king. You've made it your saviour. And like those men heading off to the Arctic, in the end, it might very well destroy you. And all talk of being in the kingdom while you actually have another king, well, that's nonsense. So here Jesus puts his finger on the issue and the rich young man simply will not let go of his king. So verse 22, his face fell. Literally in the original, his face became dark. He was shattered. He'd never heard anything like this before. And he became an increasingly sad and tragic man. 
So he had no peace when he came to Jesus. He had no peace when he was talking to Jesus. And he had no peace when he left Jesus. And isn't it interesting that Jesus lets him walk away? Jesus doesn't go running after him and say, oh dear, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Uh, We can easily find another door into the kingdom. Please come back. Jesus doesn't do that. Yes, he's grieved, no doubt, that the young man has walked away. But Jesus is God. In the uh, book, the paperback, I mentioned a moment ago, Walter Chantry writes, quote, Deceit marks many modern invitations to Christ. Let me say that again. Deceit marks many modern invitations to Christ. Congregations are reminded that they're sad, lonely, discouraged and unsuccessful. Life is a great weight. Trouble encompasses them. The future holds dark threats. And they're invited to come to Christ who will change all of that and put a smile on their face. He's pictured as a cosmic psychologist who's going to patch up all problems in one therapy session. But there's no reminder of the discipline which Christ demands. No suggestion is given that following Jesus is sacrificial and painful. And it's no surprise that many who go forward to try the modern gospel pill are never seen again. They react like a young military recruit. The recruiting sergeant has told him about seeing the world, honour, fortune and training. But nothing was said of early rising or forced marches. And there was no mention of the blood and the fire and the terror of the battlefield. And Chantry concludes like this. He says, sometimes we would do well to say to people, sit down and think before we say, stand up and follow. So there's a respectable seeker. There's a loving confrontation and lastly in the passage there is a powerful Lord. Now what I mean by this is that Jesus is able to free us from what controls us and he is able to free us for himself but no one else can do that. Here the man walks away. Interesting isn't it because normally we're used to the idea that money opens doors. But here, money actually closes the door. And Jesus very famously says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And what he means is how hard it is for those who have another king to have Jesus as our king. In other words, if you want to know how easy it is to see someone who's got a higher priority in their lives than Jesus Christ become someone who happily follows Jesus, you'll actually find it easier to squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle. In other words, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Sex and money, I think, are the big battlefields today, aren't they? I think you'd agree with that. Those are the things that derail and destroy more people than anything else. And you see, the danger is, the danger is that we can be members of a local church, but in our hearts we can find that we are dragging ourselves sluggishly to church on Sunday mornings. And in our hearts we're running as fast as we can towards the idols that we worship. And you don't need to be rich for this to become a trap in your life. Uh, You can become somebody who has set their minds on becoming wealthy and gradually you find it's become an obsession and it dominates your life. 
Well, the disciples, of course, are shocked by what Jesus says here. And that's because in the Old Testament, uh, if you were rich, it was taken as a sign of God's blessing. So they're looking at this rich young man and they're thinking, well, this man really must be blessed by God. Surely he's got a place in the kingdom. But here's Jesus saying he hasn't. So what hope is there for the rest of us? And in verse 28, Peter says, we've, we've left ever, everything to follow you. Surely we're not going to miss out, are we? And that raises an important question which we quickly need to clear up, which is, does giving up certain things earn you a place in God's kingdom? I mean, if the rich young man had said to Jesus, OK, I'll give up everything, has he earned his way into heaven? And I hope you know that the answer to that question is no. It is not possible to buy your way in or to earn or deserve a place in God's kingdom. But the bigger question in the background to this passage is, is a person able to let go of their false king and take hold of Jesus Christ in their own strength? Let go of this take hold of Jesus. Can you do that on your own? My friends, the answer to that question is no, you can't. You can't. That's what Jesus says. Verse 27. There it is in the Bible. With man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Not only can God work a surrender and and a release of our idol, but he also enables us to take hold of Jesus. And what makes that possible? What makes that possible is the love of Jesus. In fact, the entire conversation in this passage is taking place against the backdrop of the love of Christ. Please notice, Jesus loves this worldly man. You know, he's slightly slippery. He's resistant. He's a little bit sneaky. But Jesus loves him. And he shows him the way to be free. What a loving and kind thing to do. And in verses 29 and 30, we see that Jesus has already set the disciples free from this present age so that it no longer controls them. They're no longer tied to all of the things that most people give their lives to. And Jesus has already set them free for the age to come. They already belong, and they always will belong to the age to come. How loving and kind of Jesus to do that. And look how Jesus puts it in verse 29. He says, if every single believer who takes Christ seriously and gives up what needs to be given up, whether it is home or brother or parent or field. By the way, notice, will you please, the repetition of the word or, because it's very unlikely that Jesus is going to ask you to give up all of those things. Jesus says it's home or brother or parent or field. But when you do give up what needs to be given up and you're thinking to yourself, ouch, what a huge sacrifice. Look at what Jesus says in verse 30. He says, you will receive homes brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. In other words, the blessings are going to infinitely outweigh the costs. And how can Jesus talk like that? Well, he can talk like that because he's on the way to the cross where he's going to give up literally everything so that you and I can inherit everything. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very honest conversation. We thank you that you work to free people from false gods. And we thank you that you wonderfully bring people to Christ. We pray that in your love and power, you would do that wonderful work of releasing and sealing for all who are gathered here and all who are listening this morning. And above all, we thank you for the great love that you proved at the cross, giving up everything so that we might receive infinite, wonderful, eternal blessings. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.